We are all aware of the basic principle of suggestion. Now, this is a type of influence in which the mind is invited or impelled to an uncritical acceptance of recommendation or belief or thought or idea which a therapist may feel to be necessary or helpful. By uncritical we mean that the suggestion is not met by an analytical reaction. The person does not settle down to inquire in his own thinking as to whether these suggestions are rational, reasonable, demonstrable, or arise from any certainty, and he also refrains from permitting an argumentative reaction to arise within himself. Thus, the concept underlying suggestion is that it is an idea or a recommendation which passing through the mind of the patient without obstruction may become a factor in the subconscious life of the person. Now the subject of suggestion opens a wide variety of speculations and thoughts. And a few of these we want to examine a little at this time. We know, for example, that most human beings are susceptible to suggestion of one kind or another. We also know that the greatest period of receptivity is childhood. This does not mean that the child is necessarily less argumentative, although it is true that the child has less mental certainty with which to oppose suggestion. What appears to be one of the factors is that with the child there is very little conflict of subjective reaction to suggestion. The child has no counter-suggestion which must be compensated or which arise in conflict with the new suggestion factor. The child does not have a series of highly fixed opinions of its own. It does not have strong habit mechanisms in thinking. It is more or less in a formative period of development. And for these reasons, suggestion is particularly vivid, powerful, and long-enduring. As we grow older, we make a discovery that even the psychologist at the moment does not seem to fully comprehend. It is that there are two motions or two directions of energy in relation to the conditioning of the human being. One is the motion from the person outward into the world around him, part of his inevitable and instinctive effort to become dominant over his environment. He is constantly causing to move from himself fixations of defense mechanisms 
He is out aggressively using his energy over a sphere of influence which he hopes to dominate. Opposed to this motion is the pressure of conditions around him moving in upon himself. Whenever we move in upon a person with ideas of any kind, we move head on against the tide of his own outward moving consciousness. We find that we are swimming against the stream and that ideas entering into him have a much more difficult time reaching into his life because they are met by this continual outpouring of his own energy, his own convictions, his own attitudes, his own beliefs, his own theories on innumerable subjects about which he may or may not have any very solid knowledge. We know, however, also that the adult can be affected by suggestion. We are not certain, however, that this effect is exactly what we expect or hope. We are all subject to suggestion continuously at this time because nearly all forms of industry, salesmanship, economics, and the profession have become aware of the psychological factor. Many of them are working strongly upon the basic belief in the reality of suggestion as a way of influencing the private or public mind. But we observe also that they are not always successful. Take, for example, experience with television and radio advertising. There can be no doubt that the frequent repetition of certain advertising does promote sales. This cannot be denied. The facts are available. It is also, however, not to be denied that when an advertiser ceases to advertise for even a short time, his sales fall off. It means, therefore, that suggestion is not held as retentively in the mind as we might at first suppose. The first the conclusion would be that it is submerged by the continuance of other suggestions. If a company advertising coffee ceases to advertise, other advertisers of coffee gain a peculiar advantage. They begin uh, to have their suggestion enter into the mind of the uh, viewer or listener, and he in turn comes to buy that coffee most immediately advertised. Another point, however, should also be borne in mind. If advertising becomes too objectionable, if it is too continuous and too blatant, if its pretensions are too unreasonable, or its uh, advertising is in poor taste, it may result in a revulsion mechanism and the um, a presumed uh, purchaser may buy almost any other product because he is angry or rebellious against having his mind over influence. This we observe quite frequently now and probably will see more of in the not too distant future. Thus, broadly speaking, we have two points demonstrated by modern usage. First, the suggestion very rapidly ceases unless it is repeated 
and that this repetition, if continued for ten years, will not ensure that the purchaser will buy the product in the eleventh year. The pressure of the suggestion, therefore, is tied to its immediacy. And if this ceases, the suggestion loses authority. I believe we will find this to be essentially true also in psychological uh, suggestion therapy. The second point to be made is that over-suggestion creates rebellion. Not only in the purchasing of products, but throughout life. Over-suggestion in some of our family problems, we like to call nagging. And we are convinced that nagging ultimately produces no good. That the insistence upon the acceptance of ideas causes a reaction in ourselves in which we rise to defend the right of free choice, the right of personal determinism. We demand that we shall always have the privilege of accepting or rejecting any suggestion that is made to us. This right, which we have demonstrated from our earliest experience as human beings, proves conclusively that a suggestion will not overwhelm all of the faculties or elements of our natures and minds, that we will accept to varying degrees according to our temperament suggestion elements, but we will not generally go overboard. We will always hold this peculiar privilege of making up our own mind. The only way this can be more or less completely neutralized, at least temporarily, is through the use of hypnotic techniques or hypnotic drugs. Theoretically, these may temporarily overwhelm our ability uh, to defend our rights of free choice. But even in this instance, we must bear in mind that the interior part of ourselves from which our determination to be ourselves springs will recover in due time its own awareness. And after the effect of the drug or the hypnosis has worn off, self-determinism will reassert itself. The suggestion which is contrary to any abiding conviction in our own nature, or is contrary to our right to express our own individuality and freedom of choice, any such suggestion is likely to be short-lived and to have very restricted results because it is not receiving the support of our own consciousness. Another important thing we have gradually come to realize about suggestion is that the more complex our culture becomes, and the more insistent uh, and nagging suggestions become, the less effect they have. We build against even the suggestion therapist a kind of psychic antibody. We find gradually that an immunity to suggestion arises within the patient. This immunity simply means that the method, the technique, the process has exhausted its usefulness. And whereas temporarily the uncritical attitude can be held and the patient can be kept in a certain state of acceptance in time this passes, 
The physician is aware of this. The physician is aware, for example, that when he uses psychological technique, particularly in the various types of traditional or conservative therapy, that he creates a certain immediate result, which is not lasting. The old days of the bread pill perhaps are becoming less and less remembered by the living, but they were great days of therapy, when two cents worth of medication would do a hundred dollars worth of good. Today it is the reverse. We get very little real comfort out of a $20 prescription. Nearly always, the doctor knows that the first remedies which he is able to provide will have more efficacy due to the fact that the patient is in a little more receptive mood. A person filled with hope going to a physician well recommended and receiving from this physician the assurance that his case can be successfully treated, this perhaps followed by a certain amount of practical therapy, receives a powerful suggestion. This suggestion may cause a rapid almost miraculous improvement in the patient. But by degrees, uh, this element of novelty, this acceptance without the critical mind, wears off. Symptoms come back, very slightly perhaps, but enough to disillusion the patient. And in two or three months, he establishes this immunity. And the power of the physician to help him uh, on the level of psychology is comparatively lost. The same is true in advertising and in many patent medicines and in many famous cure-alls that have descended to us through time. The greatest and most important testimonials are by those who have had miraculous recoveries within the first two weeks. After six months, very few of these persons would write a testimonial. By that time, there are nine other remedies in between. But just as surely as we can have all the symptoms described on the bottle by a certain negative uh, suggestion. We also uh, can in time find that these symptoms return. We can find that the claims of the remedy will offset the symptom for a while. Then gradually facts set in again. We're back in the same old trouble. Suggestion, being by its very nature impermanent, has limitations which the best therapist must recognize. It is a bridge, giving him an immediate receptivity on the part of his patient, but ultimately only proven value can keep that relationship strong, meaningful, and resultful. If this breaks down, then we have the, the patient who has lost faith in the physician. And under such conditions, even a truly adequate doctor can do very, very little. Suggestion is therefore both positive and negative. The oldest records that we have on some of these subjects come from the Greeks. 
And Aristotle has made much of the suggestion, suggestion power of oratory. Here we are heading right into politics. The glib talker <coughs> can not only shout us down, but shout our minds into a coma for a short time. We wildly applaud, we are deeply moved, then go home and the next day wonder why we made fools of ourselves. We are unable to rationally understand how we could have been so completely hoodwinked. Well, perhaps we were not actually hoodwinked. What we really mean was, how could we be so influenced away from our normal attitudes on these things? Perhaps our attitudes were wrong in the beginning. But by the next day, our wrong attitude is back in control of the situation. We have been overwhelmed, forced into a, an uncritical relationship with another person by their bombast, by their beautiful wording, by the force of their personality, and by the common applause of other people like ourselves, all under a common glamour. All this constitutes a powerful suggestion pattern. In the field of our sciences, suggestion occupies another interesting relationship. Suggestion comes to us frequently through books. It comes to us also in prevailing modes of thought and therapy. A school for the treating of an ailment comes suddenly into existence, supported by distinguished authority, or by a most persuasive expression of its principles and its therapeutic values. This school sweeps the country. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of persons suffering from certain ailments receive a new lease on life. They really believe that now they have the answer. So they flock to the remedy. They do everything possible uh, to take advantage of this collective conviction that help will come. Two years later, the school has disappeared. It could not perform a miracle. Man wants miracles. It was unable to sustain by its actual proven merit the glamorous pretensions which had surrounded it. The hundreds of thousands of persons did not immediately recover. Comes disenchantment. The school is now regarded as a fraud. Everyone believes they have been hoodwinked. All their hopes have come to nothing. Very likely the school was not a fraud. But expecting, as we do, miraculous circumstances, we felt them for a time, and they so exaggerated our hopes that disillusionment was more tragic uh, than it would have been had our hopes been more moderate. So again, the suggestion can play an unpleasant and sometimes tragic trick upon us. Many years ago, there wandered about this country a number of spiritual healers, mostly of the evangelical nature. Uh, these persons were devout. Most of them were probably sincere. A few were undoubtedly merely theatrical. But a good many honestly believed that through prayer, and through the laying on of hands, or some other simple religious ritual, that 
they were able to be a channel for the healing power of God. They were so persuasive by their own conviction that they did convince many others. And at that time, the reports of miraculous cures were numerous. Most persons, however, never followed through on these reports. Had they followed through, they would have made two very interesting discoveries. They would have realized that certain persons did recover and remain well. Certain other persons appeared to recover, remained improved for a week, a month, two or three months, and then relapsed back again into the old condition. Why this distinct difference? The only answer lies within the individual himself. The degree to which the suggestion was actually internally accepted, the degree to which the person, through his own believing, was able to remain uncritical and was able to continue the intensity of his faith. Again, among those who were improved, a further division into two groups has to be made. Suggestion has an area of usefulness beyond which normally it cannot extend itself. Suggestion is usually a mental emotional process. Mental, perhaps, on the level of its acceptance, which must be, as we said, uncritical, but emotional in the reaction which it set up of hope, faith, and a great desire and willingness to experience benefit. If, therefore, the trouble in the beginning was in that part of the nature of man which could be reached and could be served by a new or improved consciousness toward life, it is quite conceivable that the uh, remedy might prove relatively permanent. An example is a man who has remained for a number of years very much of an atheist, or at least a negative agnostic. A thought, you know, negative agnostic. Well, I rather like it. <laughs> he was sick, and he attended one of these healing services of an evangelist. Under the pressure of seeing others help with ailments similar to his own, he temporarily put aside his skepticism, and because of his great and pressing need, he went down the sawdust trail and asked for help. He received it. He received it almost certainly as a psychological experience. He received it as an acceptance within himself. Under normal conditions, most of the persons whom he saw there also helped, soon relapsed back into their former condition. But the experience produced a certain change in this man's total attitude toward life. From the miracle of the moment, from the fact that he instantly experienced good, he was transformed almost immediately into a believer. 
His skepticism, his agnosticism, his cynical attitude toward religion was wonderfully dissipated by this experience through which he passed. He remained from that time on to the end of his life a devout person, deeply conscious of the power of religion in the life of man. Because of this, his symptoms did not return. He had changed not merely as a result of an immediate suggestion, but by means of the help offered by a suggestion, he was able to make a, a marked and important decision affecting his total consciousness. Under such conditions, the suggestion was the bridge which led him uh, to a far more complete recovery. Such is the same problem at Lourdes or saint anne de beaupre or any of the great healing shrines of the Christian and non-Christian world. For in both spheres, spiritual healing is by no means an unusual uh, phenomenon. Thus we have in suggestion a present help and it takes on many of the aspects of ordinary medication. It is an optimistic position indeed who affirms that his treatment cures the disease. Usually he is content if he can bring the body into a better state or a better condition to assert its own rules of health over the ailment. If therefore the physician can be an honest secretary of nature. If he can assist nature, he is content. Suggestion can also assist nature, but not if in its substance or essence it is contrary to nature. Suggestion then goes on into many fields of relative importance from a psychological standpoint, but we must cope with a number of these fields as we proceed to try to understand them better. A suggestion made by a person whom we do not respect will seldom have much influence. We must have some openness, and there are two ways in which openness comes. One, by respecting the source of the information, and the other is respecting the information itself. Uh, the power of Adolf Hitler to sway the German people was not, I think, because Germany universally respected or admired the man. Certainly that would be practically impossible particularly for a country which had achieved the intellectual scientific level which Germany had attained. But Adolf Hitler was saying things that a great many Germans wanted to believe. And perhaps they did not want to believe them as excessively as he said them. But they certainly did realize or did accept that the things that he said conformed with their own feelings on a great many subjects. Let's take a homely example. If a very wise man comes and tells you that you are wrong, you may, through great respect for that man, be influenced or receive the suggestion to examine his remarks or even to accept his counsel. If a very foolish man comes and tells you that you are right, that man almost immediately rises in your estimation. <laughs> you come to the conclusion <coughs> that regardless of where he got the information, he is inspired. 
<laughs> Thus we may react with openness of consciousness to the authority of the great or to good news, information which we desire to receive, which will support our prejudice or will give comfort to our opinion or will add something to our estimation of our own stature. In these ways, suggestions move in upon us and become powerful influences sometimes, even tragic ones, in the continuance of our affairs. History and experience tells us, however, that it is not common for us to find a person sufficiently, completely noble, completely acceptable, that we will be remain indefinitely uncritical to his advice or to his recommendation. After a time, we become inevitably aware of the humanity in our fellow man. We observe that he does things which we do not approve of. We observe that he is not always successful. And we begin to suspect that we are under glamour. That this person's advice may not be as good as at first we believed it to be. And as our faith in the person is diminished, it's the usefulness of the faith in our lives crumbles and falls. From a very ancient time, therefore, powerful advice, suitable to change the course of life, to change the history of nations, uh, to provide the most powerful inducements to the modification of character, such advice had to have an authority. And this authority came ultimately to be vested not in man, but in God. The only being that we could not sufficiently fathom to unveil. The only power so great that it could not crumble before the onsets of time and change. The only strength so absolute that it could not be exhausted or fatigued by occurrences was the divine strength itself. Also, God was about the only concept of a being which could be all-knowing not only about life and the world but also about us. God was the only principle, energy, power, or form of consciousness that, that we could not deceive or, who, or which could be um, sufficiently perfect so that its advice would be infallible. Thus, from the earliest time, religion has exercised the strongest collective suggestion power on man. And this suggestion, most of it now embodied within sacred books, remains for most persons a source of leadership, of guidance or direction which they can accept uncritically. In fact, religion at a reasonably early date wrote criticism out of itself. And for thousands of years, religions taught their followers not to question. Because if they questioned, the magic of believing fell apart. Today we have people 
who thought of ridicule this. They say, let's ask some very pointed questions and ask them now. Let's get this all straightened out. So they ask the question. They break the mysterious little magic pattern that faith set up in the remote past. They discover after they have asked questions and debated largely with themselves in the name of God, uh, that they are not struck dead with a thunderbolt, that God does not avenge himself upon anyone who asks questions. So they go blissfully on their way, feeling that they have unveiled the infinite. But deity has had its own quiet revenge in its own quiet way. These persons have lost the strength of believing. Something has been taken out of them. A virtue has passed from them. And as a result of that, they are rewarded for their critical attitudes by a whole group of psychological plagues which have arisen simply from the individual no longer having a non-critical relationship with life. He is much more interested now in proving that his own thoughts are right. So he has his own thoughts. He proves them to his own satisfaction, and perhaps the satisfaction of some other people. And then he gets sick immediately and goes to a psychologist. <laughs> he has paid a very great price for a very little ego satisfaction. In addition to these great suggestions that have thundered from the Mount of Sinai, that have been found in the Sermon on the Mount, or set forth in the Tripitakas of Buddha, in addition to these tremendous suggestions that remain apart from life, often in conflict with our everyday experience, yet still too strong for us to resist internally. We have, in addition, the early records of certain sanctified persons prophets, messiahs, teachers come from God. The course of time, the human limitations or imperfections of these teachers have been forgotten. We no longer remember the simple, ordinary circumstances that must have played a large part in the lives of these people. We remember them only as haloed, mysterious God-men, whose words also ring down through time, for they spoke with the authority of God. And those were the days when the judges judged in Israel. And those were the days the early Christian mystics communed with the apostles and the disciples and set up the foundations of their faith. It is very difficult for us to be uncritical with the simple, ordinary facts of life. But it is also very difficult for us to be rationally critical of a miracle. Between us and these persons are centuries of silence. We no longer know them or their descendants or the descendants of these descendants. They remain only in the elaborate tapestry of our own subconscious devisements. We create images of them. We worship them. We regard them, we revere them. 
We hold them as something apart. And when we read their words, or hear others read their words, we achieve a state of uncritical acceptance. Acceptance based upon a whole series of psychological experiences. These words brought consolation to our fathers, and to their fathers before them. They have been the guides of our race. Before these words, Washington knelt in prayer at Valley Forge. And in the presence of this consolation, Lincoln knelt in the White House. The men we honor, the men we regard as peculiarly noble, the men whose strength came from this uncritical acceptance of the power of God in the life of man. This, therefore, is the great suggestion. And nearly all the moral culture of our race, nearly all of what slender advancement we have achieved, whatever of good spurs us on, to try to build a civilization out of the chaos of our own selfishness. Whatever great inspiration and insight we have known have come from the suggestion of these gods and their divine projects. Therefore, when we come down to our own little daily living, suggestion presents a series of rather interesting facts or elements. If our physician says to us, I think you're hating yourself into trouble, we say, well, Dr. Jones, if you'd gone through what we've gone through, you would have hated yourself into trouble too. Jones probably will agree. <laughs> But if Jones instead says to you, my friend, remember those words, love thine enemies, and do good unto them that despitefully use you, you stump. Jones isn't speaking for himself. Jones is only telling us something against which we have almost no conscious resistance. Therefore, the skill of Dr. Jones may lie partly in his ability to quote scripture. And I suspect that some of the failures of modern psychology has, have resulted from the fact that psychologists have not been good Bible students. In their intellectual emancipation, they have turned and the most powerful remedy that they have in the Western world. That is the authority of the suggestion which arises from the religious tradition of our people. For well, this men will die without asking why. For well, this they will live, content in the hope of some future good. This suggestion uh, is very, very vital to us in nearly all forms of therapy. Now, the next suggestion that is very important to us is derived from this same religious source, namely that God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. We have a confidence and this confidence is uncritical. If we wish to take the scientific problem and sit down and try to analyze how God answers prayer, we're lost. If we try to wonder what is happening in one, one side of the world while God is taking care of the other side of the world, we are also in a dilemma. It is like the small child's question as to how Santa Claus can be in so many places at one time. The moment we think 
we, are, we take on a critical relationship to knowledge, to fact, to all these things. And in that moment, we lock ourselves against the power of receiving suggestions. If, however, uncritical, we do take the action of the immediate availab availability of the fact of divine help, then this ancient conviction, which is in our blood, archetypal in our consciousness, against which our consciousness has no defense, because our own consciousness believes it is true. With this, we do not have to wrestle as Jacob wrestled with the Indians. We do not have to argue these things. The moment we argue a religion, we defile it. But in this simple fact, we now have another suggestion factor that becomes important. If this suggestion is accompanied by some element or some factor which involves God or involves religion. Its effectiveness, or its intensity at least, is magnified a hundredfold. We are no longer able to bring against it the immediate adversity of our own thinking. Let us take a very simple example of this particular point. An individual has lived for a long time under the attitude that there is no justice in the world. Many people develop that gem of thinking as they proceed through the years. It rises from such convictions as the observation that nearly every wrong person is well treated and that no matter how hard we labor, we are never rewarded. Nurse this for a while, and we have a nice, solid, negative fixation. So we take the attitude there is no justice in the world. A lawyer, a legislator, or a judge might be able to give us a considerable amount of intellectual insight and show that while there are mistakes, that the general trend of man is to try to be just, so we're still miserable. We may go to a psychologist who points out to us all the defects in our own reason, or perhaps allows us to uh, unveil our soul and dump upon him and the whole environment all of these negative instincts which we have been nursing so long. He believes that if we can exhaust ourselves completely, if we can talk about the injustice of the universe until we're tired of hearing it ourselves, that maybe we'll change our conversation. This sometimes happens. But by the time we leave the doctor's office, we get his bill, and then we do not believe in the justice of the universe all over again. <laughs> Actually, we have no real argument to prove that right must win. We see evidence of it. We observe how tyrants and despots nearly always come to a sorry end. We have moral instruction to that point. But we can say that we are descended from a group of fuddy-duddies, as far as that is concerned. But if within ourselves we suddenly become intensely aware of the power of a divine principle, if we internally suddenly believe that God is in his heavens and all is right with the world, and this becomes a reality in ourselves. We then neutralize out of a common conviction the problem of our own particular 
this bit. We begin to sense that the trouble is not in the universe, but in ourselves. And then as we must instinctively defend God, if we are a believer, we can no longer assume that deity is unable to prevent evil or unminded to do so. We begin to have to argue with ourselves about this. And no matter how we argue, instinct forces us to let God win. So to the suggestion that is made, if we can add this authority of high conviction, we achieve a great deal. Now, philosophy is very much like religion in this respect. Religion makes good a reality. Philosophy makes good a fact. By philosophy, we take the type of mind that is critical and whittle down its criticism. By philosophy, we can take the individual with a whole quantity of objection, and we can meet his objection one by one. And if our philosophy is adequate, that is, if it is basic, we can finally force the individual, at least to the grudging assent, that this life is under laws and under rules and under principles, and that if he is a wise man, he will obey them. This suggestion, supported therefore by philosophical insight, may be almost as strong as religion. But it lacks the one thing that religion has, and that is the warmth of a vital participation in believing. It is the warmth of religion which experiences truth, even while philosophy defines it. Now, theoretically, we are in a scientific age, and let us not forget for a moment that that age and its principles and its rules, its convictions, and its degree of insight. Let us not for a moment assume that these are not powers of suggestion in our daily living. Ultimately, science undoubtedly will have to bestow powerful, positive uh, suggestion upon the mind of man in order to prevent man from utterly befuddling himself with scientific knowledge. Science must finally come to positive, basic suggestion based upon its own discoveries. And these suggestions must be therapeutically sound, or they will destroy man. Science, perhaps, can suggest to the outer part of man what religion and philosophy can convey to his inner life. But the end of scientific suggestion is that it must be valid because it can overcome or nullify the criticism in the person who is receiving scientific knowledge. Our modern system of education is based upon breaking down man's non-scientific ideas. This is a weakening situation, however. For actually, when we break the suggestion that he is going to be patient, he's going to be patient and kind and gentle from now on. The only reason he is asking for this help or wants this suggestion is because he has been unkind and unreasonable over a very long period of time. He has had a nasty disposition since the beginning of his own memories of himself. Now he wants to really reform. Perhaps the reform has been thrust upon him by the misery of circumstance. 
He can't get along with himself anymore, and no one else can get along with him. This is affecting his pocketbook, and that is a real disaster. So what is he asking? He is asking that a therapist of some kind shall give him a formula, bring him into the office, give him a little psychological brushing every couple of days, send him on his way with new conviction that he can be master of his own destiny and he can be a lovable, noble person if he so desires. He keeps on repeating to himself that he not only can be, but that he is. This individual probably doesn't believe it himself. He knows himself too well. So his suggestion falls upon sterile ground. Furthermore, he spends five minutes every morning and five minutes every evening making this noble, platitudinous remark about himself to himself. And the rest of the day is as cussed as ever. <laughs> the timing factor here is a little difficult. Nature operates more or less honorably. If you want to take a dollar out of the bank, you must put a dollar in. If you want to change a habit from a bad habit to a good habit, you cannot can practice the bad habit most of the time and the good habit a small part of the time and expect the good to neutralize the bad. You cannot repeat 50 times in rapid succession that you are getting better and better and for the rest of your waking hours continue to get worse and worse. The suggestion is not as strong as the habit, is the point that we're trying to subtly convey. Actually, the only way that you can win a battle of this kind is to have the two armies of approximately equal strength. That may end in a draw, but you cannot uh, overcome the habits of a lifetime, or the intensities of the daily repetitions of these habits now, by a few well curled or turned phrases. You may gain a certain result, but it cannot achieve too much, because there, are, there is too much negative static involved in the situation. As soon as Otto's suggestion, or even suggestion itself for that matter, because it is often so used, became a wee bit popular, and individuals believed that they had gotten hold of the great and divine magical mystery of the universe, they also attempted to use this suggestion concept in a variety of ways for which it was never intended. The individual began to believe that he could mentalize himself, not, out, not only out of misery into health, but out of poverty into prosperity. He began to honestly believe, with such degree of honesty as he could believe, that he had found a magic wand which could transform everything and anything by a fixed attitude of the mind and the repetition of a formula. This led to innumerable complications. It also led largely to the general discrediting of a large part of the field of suggestion and auto suggestion. It meant that we were in the presence of an excess, more or less a corruption of an idea. And that which was intended to change man was directed to changing other things instead of man. The individual began to take the attitude 
that if he was not getting well, getting along well in the world, that his suggestion could go so far as to make the world change and treat him better. It's a lot of suggestions. In fact, as far as changing the world, even the divine suggestion seems to operate slowly. Also, we gained a certain telepathic attitude towards suggestion and not of suggestion. We believed that we could sit around and by holding various thoughts cause our neighbors to move out <laughs> or our distant friends to move in. We began to think of suggesting real estate transactions, good investments, and in many instances I've actually known people to suggest that other people should be stupid, simply so that we could impose upon them more easily. <laughs> this, of course, was, a, was a, a little nightmare world of its own, more, di more difficult and inconsistent and fantastic than Prospero's Enchanted Isle. The most that we did, of course, was to keep on suggesting to ourselves that we could achieve the impossible. Sometimes it looked as though we made it. But we began to ignore utterly the laws of probability. We forgot, for example, that in sickness, unless diagnosis has proof that we have a very serious ailment, miscellaneous, wandering, itinerant symptoms, grief, misfortunes, and misery of a thousand assorted nature will, in about 20 cases out of 25, uh, simply solve themselves. Nature, stepping in, will cure most of the minor ailments that arise in man. It gives them a chance. But if we have some kind of a magic formula, we forget the natural operation and give credit to the formula for things the formula had nothing to do with. Furthermore, by this process, we gain greater and greater confidence in the formula. And someday we trust our weight too heavily upon it, and this bridge of believing collapses under it. Other suggestion <coughs> then leads to a whole series of rather sobering reflections. That it can produce certain results, we do not doubt. Auto-suggestion means that we suggest something to ourselves. Why do we use this technique? Usually because of some weakness in character, which makes it difficult for us to head into a proper, normal, reasonable correction of our own troubles. The individual says, well, I drink a little too much. I've tried 15 times to quit. Now I'd like a nice working formula of auto-suggestion so that while I sleep, I will get over the habit. There's no implication that this individual wants to work his way through that. He really is out looking for one of these psychological painkillers or these universal remedies like the old Swanee Indian swamp syrup, which was supposed to take care of everything, including all unreasonable indulgence. This individual is trying to use suggestion or other suggestion to take the place of the weakness of his own will. Well, he is up against a number of possibilities. If he decides on the auto-suggestive process, he will almost certainly turn his suggestion against the habit he wishes to cure. He does not know, will not accept, nor believe, or realize 
that the habit is only an expression of himself. That he will never get over the habit adequately until he becomes a better person. And that's the one thing he doesn't want to do. Because that recommends or suggests hard work. <laughs> the only way we can get out of weakness, neg negativity, or inadequacy is to outgrow these things. So what we really need is growth. We need to become the kinds of person who will not make the silly mistakes we are now trying to get out of by auto-suggestion. It is true that we can, by suggestion, suggestion means, anesthetize an arm so that you will not feel any pain in it while surgery is performed. We can, for 48 hours or 72 hours, block the alcoholic desire. If you want to come uh, to an approved therapist often enough, you can block it for several months. But this is not recovery. Any more than an aspirin cures some kind of a pain in the body. You can take certain painkillers and temporarily get relief from a toothache. But the only solution is, finally, to either have the cavity filled or the tooth pulled. In suggestion, we have an emergency instrument that can be and often is exceedingly useful. But it is never a solution nor a substitute for the correction of the situation itself. The only point where there is an exception to this rule is where the area of suggestion is exactly in the area of the problem. For instance, it is easier to help by suggestion a person who is involved in some complex or other situation for which the suggestion is the sole and total remedy. If, for example, you can uh, take a person who is fearful or who has, for example, claustrophobia, you take this person and you give him a powerful suggestion or you help him to formulate an auto-suggestion that he can enter into a room, a small, dark room, and close the door and not be afraid. You probably can give him sufficient self-confidence or by the magic of auto-suggestion he can imagine himself into having a degree of confidence that he always possessed and didn't know it. He goes in, closes the door, after a little while he comes out, radiant. The problem is solved. And the chances are, as far as he is concerned, the problem is solved. He now knows that he can go into that room. He has done it. That was all the remedy that was required, was to experience that the room was not terrible or terrifying. Once having gained that experience, the matter is closed. Except what caused the claustrophobia. You've gotten rid of the symptoms. Six months later, this individual may de develop some other symptoms. He may suddenly become a rank, uncontrolled warrior. He might develop a temporary or even growing loss of hearing. He may become accident prone and start falling over his own shadow. He may suddenly become extremely suspicious of his friends. He doesn't have claustrophobia anymore, but we've only treated an effect. The cause still remains. The 
suggestion, an auto suggestion, will not, in most instances, adequately treat causes. Unless the cause is extremely shallow and recent or comparatively unimportant, we cannot be sure that we can reach it uh, in a permanent way. But now let us suppose that suggestion or auto-suggestion is indicated in this case. We then come to another problem which has some meaning, and that is the use of mechanical devices uh, to make auto-suggestion more effective by increasing the frequency of it. Assuming, of course, as we said, a concerning suggestion that something has to be done to balance off because five minutes of right suggestion will not compensate for 23 hours and 55 minutes of bad attitude. So now comes uh, a discovery which I think more or less was influenced by the war. Uh, we found it rather important to suddenly train men in language. We needed uh, very quickly a number of linguists, and if there's one department of American education that is weak, it is the languages. We live in such a large country that we do not need languages, as many foreign countries do. All we need is a solid vocabulary and a reasonable amount of slang. We can then become mutually understood. But suddenly we found that we needed several thousand persons who could speak Japanese, or Korean, or Russian, or perhaps Finnish, or the language of the Laplanders. We didn't have any such people. And the few that might have had such knowledge might not be in an age bracket suitable for military use. So to train men in language, we hit upon the device of using recordings. Recordings not merely as to, uh, to be studied in the normal way of a half hour of listening, but recordings to be played almost continuously. Recordings in which pronunciation, the form of the words, the sequences, the enunciation, the emphases, and so forth of a language, the meanings of these words, the grammar, and every factor of it, was continuously and repeatedly conveyed to us, day and night. As a result of this type of instruction, men learned languages with considerable fluency in six months, far more than they could have learned in any other way. This led to the inevitable belief that during periods of other occupation, or even during periods of sleep, suggestion can be continuously poured in upon us for the purpose of creating a more or less complete compensation for the counteraction of our own personalities and temperaments. <coughs> This worked out in a number of instances rather well, temporarily. But it did not work uh, over a long period of time. Actually, this suggestion, moving in upon the person, did not have the validity in his own experience. He was asked to accept suggestions that could be used in the case of language because all it had to do was reach his memory and the retentive areas. And the suggestion can be held in that way. But there's a great deal of difference between remembering and being moved. We all remember the words of Jesus but we don't live them. It is perfectly possible to have in our memory 
all kinds of constructive insight and understanding. But to move this from memory into action, or to change it from merely being on file and get it into use, this is different and not nearly so easy to accomplish. Thus, a noble suggestion or auto-suggestion brought into our attention may temporarily cause us to obey it as we would under hypnosis. But we cannot be at all overly confident that this suggestion will become a dynamic changing the individual factually and actually. In defense of what I am saying, I would like to mention that I have known personally a great number of individuals who have taken long and difficult courses in auto-suggestion. They have worked with it. They have tried every known means. They have used mechanical devices to repeat the suggestion day or night, the suggestion itself was in many instances luminous, transcendent, magnificent. But after several years of it, the individuals who practiced it are not luminous, nor are they transcendent. They have gained, perhaps, certain mechanical help. <coughs> they may have been able to get over a bad but I have not been able to convince myself that an individual with a nasty temper could subject themselves to any type of auto-suggestion for five years and come out with an angelic disposition. I have not seen it. I would love to see it. I don't care how they got the disposition, I just love to see the disposition. <laughs> but it just does not seem to happen. But this I will say, these people come out of it believing that they have an angelic disposition. But it's not quite the same thing. We get pointers on that from their friends and relatives. We know people who have convinced themselves that through these processes they have strengthened intuition, become practically mystic, uh, actually have they have trodden upon the threshold of illumination. But when you try to work with them or live with them, they're the same old people you knew before. They believe, but they have converted the mind only. They have not actually altered the life processes. Now, out of suggestion, in order to alter life processes, has got to accomplish the same thing that we referred to before in connection with suggestion. Man has very little confidence in himself. He just knows himself too well. He has very little confidence in his own insight, his own wisdom, and less in his own strength. Unless he is an egotist when he will not even seek self-improvement, he is weak. So he will create a suggestion, and he will repeat it. But even as he repeats it, he will not believe it. He may hope, but he remains in a state of peculiar breathless expectancy. The only way that he could finally convert himself is by a miracle. If he held some suggestion or other suggestion for a few hours and a miraculous event occurred, he might then have greater courage. He might go on more industriously. But this is not the common pattern of things. And the miraculous events, if they do occur, are usually shown to be fortuitous circumstances. So we can't depend upon this. Well, the only problem that can help the individual who is all alone with his own suggestion is again magic. 
mystery. Actually primitive man is all alone with his own suggestion. He gained a mysterious power to be greater than himself or to outgrow his own limitations or to transcend his own frailty by use of devices of which the most common to descend to our remembrance is the fetish or the talisman or the amulet. Even today, persons in hazardous professions make use of these devices as a source of self-confidence. Now, what is the reason why a rabbit's foot is any different than a good text on other suggestions by a prominent psychologist? The, the text cannot be accepted uncritically. We read it, we wonder a little, we think a little, but we're not very certain. And even if we're rather certain, we say, yes, it's probably true, but I doubt if I can do it never done anything right yet, and it doesn't look as though this is the time when I'm going to start. So the situation drifts at least half-heartedly. But a rabbit's foot is different. <laughs> In the first place, it makes no sense, except when it's on the foot of a rabbit. <laughs> We're not even quite sure how it came to be a fetish at all. Unless perhaps it was because the rabbit was anciently associated with the moon and a whole string of myths and legends tie it together. Now when I'm you saying a rabbit's foot, I mean almost any kind of talent. It may be a piece of metal inscribed with the 72 names of God. It may be a Muslim charm upon which is traced in beautiful writing of uh, the name of Allah and his faith. It may be a prayer, it may be anything. It may be one of those wonderful little devices uh, that look more than anything else like a child's drawing. It is worn by the pearl fishers of the Philippine Islands when they go down under the sea in search of pearls. It is something that has a magic power. Now this magic power rises from an atavistic level of our own subconscious. We do not believe in ourselves. We do not believe in our neighbors. We may doubt our clergymen. We gravely suspect our doctor. And we are much delusioned in the, disillusioned in our psychologists. But a rabbit's foot is different. <laughs> a rabbit's foot is mystery. Perhaps it'll work. It's just like the individual who is not superstitious but never walks under a ladder. <laughs> He's just careful. <laughs> Now, what you think about this, you realize that the rabbit's foot to the average person is a kind of demoralizing factor. It takes away most of the common sense. Therefore, when the time comes uh, for us to make an affirmation, or to try to suggest ourselves into something, or to achieve an auto-suggestive intention, it might be different we make this thing, if we say these words, if we hold this thought with all our strength, at the same time take a tight hold on a rabbit's foot. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese say that if one religion is good, two are better. <laughs> so there is no use missing a good opportunity. <laughs> In the same way, when we say in our prayer to ourselves, God, give me an understanding heart. 
uh, we have a different attitude because we are asking something of a force that is abstract and mysterious which we believe can be stolen. And if magically we say, I am normally a coward, but while I hold in my hand this golden charm upon which is written the name of my God, as long as I hold on to that, I am strong. The individual is suddenly courageous. There are thousands of cases of it, critically recorded, that this kind of auto-suggestion is strong. And it is strong because it applies to the inner part of our consciousness. And that it also does not depend upon our strength to overcome our own weakness. We do not believe that we are strong enough. We cannot conceive intellectually that we can take hold of our own bootstraps and lift ourselves off the ground. But if something else, some mysterious symbol of power, moves with us, then God and one constitutes a majority. If we can use something which stimulates our faith, makes us feel that this victory is not our own, but the victory of a power greater than ourselves which we have known how to call upon. And the help of this power is an ever-present help in time then we are no longer depending on our own suggestion. We have stated in our own consciousness what we hope for, what we desire to have happen, what perhaps we feel desperately that we need. But it is not the voice of man crying in the wilderness. It is the fulfillment of a promise that if we will do certain things, take certain attitudes, supply ourselves with certain magical implements, then suddenly we are strong. We have the power through these other means of accomplishing what we cannot accomplish alone. This shifts our source of strength to an abstraction which cannot be un which cannot be overthrown by events or conditions. This abstraction gives us the courage. It is again and again this which comes back to us in the prayer formula. Prayer is suggestion, auto-suggestion in many instances, given strength by devotion. Prayer is therefore the individual opening himself uncritically to universal good. He could try to argue himself into it, but he cannot win because he does not believe his own argument. But if he follows the ancient way of his faith, certain in his own heart that the God of his fathers will not forsake him, he is no longer merely making a suggestion. He is affirming a conviction. And out of this total affirmation of his nature, he is able to achieve a result against the preponderance of negative factors. The individual who speaks with the fullness of his own conviction supported by his concept of the presence of a divine available, can in five minutes a day counteract the 23 hours and 55 minutes. Because those 23 hours and 55 minutes do not represent one coordinated conviction of weakness, they represent largely confusion. They do not represent 
a focused intensity of evil. Nor do they represent one simple pattern of infirmity. <coughs> they represent a group of negative factors, habitually perpetuated, but about which we have the deepest moral reservation. The average person who is wrong knows it, particularly on the levels of ethics or on the level of internal motivation or on the basis of principle. He is wrong, he knows it, but he is too weak to do anything else. So the negation of the confusion of the mind will cause him to say, this I cannot do. This I cannot face. This is too much for me. I'm going down for the third time. But this does not constitute an organized, powerful, psychically sustained fact of consciousness. It represents dilemma, distress, disaster, but not a certitude of evil or a certainty of misery. If, therefore, you turn against it a powerful, unified conviction, not an attitude or a plan, but a need sustained by the recognition of the factor of divine intercession, the miracle, the fetish, the rabbit's foot. This is stronger than the negative confusion which permits the difficulty to continue. For this reason, a tremendous religious experience as Havelock Ellis points out, can in a fraction of a second completely change a whole life. So we have, again, the extensity of a pressure, the intensity of a compensating pressure. In nature, these two values must be equal to produce the neutralizing of a condition. If a situation takes 10 years to get into, it does not necessarily take 10 years to get out of. But you must use as much energy to get out as you use to get in. If, however, you concentrate your energy on the problem of recovery, you can create a tremendous catharsis very rapidly in which you achieve the full emotional energy equivalent of a long enduring negative habit. You achieve it and neutralize this habit far more rapidly than you acquired it. Not because you have found an easy way out, but because you have found a more efficient way to solve the problem. Efficiency in this case being merely directness. The victory of a consciousness or a principle over a condition. If then in either suggestion or auto-suggestion we use merely formulas or we try to hold attitudes that are strange to us even though we want that. It is my opinion that our labors will be the, for the most part fruitless, except in the same way and to the same degree that we might see temporary remedy in an extremity by the use of some drug which will not cure but may make better treatment possible under more fortunate circumstance. If, however, by suggestion and auto-suggestion, we mean the intensification of values by which we are capable of basically changing our own relationship with life, this means that we must have available an emotional quotient. We must not 
affirm or suggest. We must experience. We must know the fact of this upon our own skin. We must live through the condition and know that it is so. And to achieve this greater insight, this greater degree of insight, we must move the internal part of our lives. We cannot keep on tossing these suggestions into the deep well of our own unconscious. We have got to move from the unconscious. We've got to stir out of this mysterious cave in which, like Fafna, we have been sleeping. We have got to accept the challenge of internal change the correction of a problem through the attainment of an insight which is superior to that problem. Because a problem only exists because our knowledge is inferior to our need. The platitude is not a, sub a substitute for knowledge, neither is an affirmation or a suggestion. It can be, however, that out of the union of a suggestion with a fetish, with an emblem or symbol of the divine availability, we may be impelled not to use God merely to get us out of the dilemma, but rather to become aware of the experience of the God consciousness in ourselves. If we are able to make this progressive step through faith or through profound believing, we may then be able to pass constructively into a non-critical state, a non-critical condition which is not merely negative, but one which is open or receptive to the experience of a better life. Suggestion, then, is only valuable to the degree that it can impel us toward experience. We cannot cure ignorance with hypnosis, but we can sometimes stimulate in the individual the desire to become learned. But this means he must then go out and learn. Suggestion cannot save the individual uh, from the problems towards which he usually will direct suggestion. But it can perhaps inspire him or recommend to him that he learns to grow and in that way finds the answer to all problems. For this reason, we should be very wise, very careful, in the decision of suggestion or auto-suggestion. For it must always be a suggestion to become better, not merely a suggestion to evade or avoid, or a suggestion which might bring us something we do not feel like earning. All suggestion that is appropriate and proper is that which impels us to the adventure of the unfoldment of our own consciousness as the final solution to every problem that stems from ignorance. And all problems stem from ignorance. No problem rises from wisdom itself. And our search for the spiritual integrity to overcome the ignorance in ourselves is perhaps the one great prayer that should be with us constantly, and therefore that we should suggest to ourselves that day by day, in every way, we are more eager to grow. And that, well, wonderfully enough, will also take care of most of the aches and pains because most of them arise simply 
of the individual in the presence of the invitation to grow and lacking the ability or the inclination to accept the invitation. So if we do not know what to do, all that rabbit foot time, close your eyes and dive into an experience, learning from it all that you can. Seek not to avoid or evade, but rather to overcome all uncertainty by the certainty of personal awareness through experience of the values and principles governing human life. If you take care of this properly, I think you'll do fairly well. And our time is up, so we'll see again next week.